Send in the clouds. <laughs> Bring down the rain. <laughs> Shut off the blinds. And turn out the lights. I feel the same. Well, thanks for coming down. Has everybody had a good weekend so far? The, uh, oh, yeah. the heavenly yeah. event. <laughs> well, I was thinking, what a great idea to do that here. It's just a perfect place for something like this. So, uh, well, me and Mark here, we're going to talk about music uh, if you want to join in. So, Mark, so um, what we talked about before was uh, you kept. You came from uh, Ellenburg. Is it Ellensburg or is it Ellenburg? Ellensburg. Yeah. And I've actually been there. It's like a, a little town in the middle of nowhere, about two hours from Seattle. Uh, two and a half, three hours. And what, what was it like uh, as a place to grow up? I mean, was it fairly isolated? Really isolated. Um, you know, there was um, not much to do. It's a, mainly a cattle ranching farming community, um, you know, so for kids, not much to do. So, so the music you got into, I mean, how would you find that kind of music? I mean, what was the initial music you liked when you were growing up in the, uh, I guess, 70s, mid-70s, coming to late 70s? Did much music reach that? I mean, you, you, do, you just kind of start with something like Kiss that move on to like punk rock or what's the, what's the route? Well, Kiss was actually the first show that I saw. <laughs> but um, the first music that really sort of, um, you know, struck me was uh, like the original punk rock, um, The Damned, the Stranglers, Ramones, stuff before that, like uh, New York Dolls, Stooges, Velvet Underground, 13 Four Elevators. That was the stuff that, you know, I was really getting into. At the same time, I was also hearing Jimi Hendrix for the first time. And um, my dad gave me a couple of uh, old blues records, Sunhouse and uh, Lightning Hopkins. So it was sort of, you know, wherever it was coming from, I was, I was hearing it. It's pretty well from the start. It's, it's the base you kind of worked off all times, so it's right from the very beginning. The, kind of the new stuff and the blues, the, the old stuff, it's, it's already there in your DNA. So how, how, did you, what, how did you find these punk records? Because at the time, obviously like nowadays, you just Google everything and it's there. But that's, I, I'm intrigued by the sense of isolation. It's hard enough getting half these records growing up in England, but there it must be really difficult. Yeah, I got really lucky. Uh... Like I said, my, my town is really small, like 10,000 people, but there was also a small university there. And um, one of the uh, businesses that was close to the university was a comic book sh shop that also sold some records. And as a kid, I collected comic books and was in the, the shop one day and was looking through a box of magazines that he was giving away. And there was a, a copy of Cream magazine and some pictures of Iggy Pop and I can't remember who else, but I was like, you know, asked the old hippie guy who ran the shop, well, what is this? And he was like, you know, I got some of this, some of this stuff uh, in a box back here. He actually had some of these records. I don't know where, uh, you know, what his connection was to that, but and uh, played, I want to say, I know one of the first things I heard was Anarchy in the UK, and that was just, you know, might as well have been somebody speaking from Mars to me, so, but it uh, gave me sort of, a, you know, an electric feeling, and um, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and the next day I brought in all my comic books and traded them for uh, credit for used records and ended up you know buying his whole box of 45s and then later I would take the Greyhound bus to Seattle and other uh, bigger cities in the area and actually look for records. So Seattle was like the key city 
from what, what nearby where you lived? It was the metropolis, you know, yeah. but a couple hundred miles from where I lived, and mm. on the other side of uh, a huge mountain range, you know, so again, it, it was really like another state because Western Washington is, you know, uh, a lot like, um, say, Manchester weather wise, you know, it's <laughs> sort of dark within me. <laughs> <laughs> And where I come from is the, is the desert part of Washington State. There's actually a, a high desert there and very hot summers and um, a lot of wind, sand. It's actual sand dunes. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, you know, it was like taking a trip to a, a, a very different place. So you're into this kind of music. Was there anybody in town that's... Was it like a small scene of people into it, or are you very much on your own? <laughs> no, I started hearing that stuff when I was like 13, 14 years old, and it wasn't until I was 18 that I met anybody that, you know, even had any clue as to what I was talking about. But again, nobody in my town even listened to Jimi Hendrix, and, you know, that was something that I always think of as being very strange because. A, Hendrix is from Washington, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, B, by 1978, and, you know, a lot of people knew who Jim yeah. Hendrix was. Yeah. So it really is that isolated, they're just, you know what, was all the people basically just fell into Kiss and that was it? Well, I, I don't even know how many people were into Kiss, I, I think um, it was more uh, sort of AM radio, uh, country western music from the 70s which you know was not bad music actually in retrospect stuff like Waylon Jennings and um, Willie Nelson stuff like that but as far as like rock you know forget it it was <clears throat> a complete wasteland so the other, the other people you find in that who were roughly into the same kind of music I guess was on the rest of the screaming trees what's the rest of the screaming trees I met one of them um I was in a detention hall in high school in my last year where they put you for acting out uh, after school. You have to spend extra time or whatever. And there was a kid in there wearing a t-shirt. Uh, I can't remember exactly uh, what punk rock t-shirt. And I was like, you know, how do you know about this? Start, start a conversation with him. He ended up being the bass player in the Screaming Trees. He was uh, three or four years younger than me. But that's how I met him. Through him, met his brother and the other guys that uh, they already actually had a band and were writing songs. So um, I guess I just, I was the isolated one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that you joined that gang. Exactly. Yeah. So we talked about before, but you joined sort of as a drummer, but not really as a drummer, because you had to have a bit of a drum kit. Right, yeah. Well, actually, I was just a weed salesman who had... <laughs> <laughs> who had traded some weed for a half a drum set. <laughs> I had a, a floor tom and a ride cymbal and a snare, and the guys in the trees had already had bands and two of them were brothers and they didn't get along from the start and at some point before I ever started playing with them they decided they didn't want to play together anymore and uh, wanted to, one of them wanted to make me his new drummer because their old drummer was going to be his new singer and of course I was a hideous failure as a drummer and <laughs> Arguably, as a singer, <laughs> <laughs> but I was a guy that ended up singing. And what What was the idea of the band? And obviously, you're so isolated out there. You're the only four, five, six kids in that little pool into that kind of music. I mean, what do you do? Who do you play to? Where do you go? Was it Was it just purely this is just a garage band playing for fun, or was it? I think we've got to get out of this town. Well, the guy who none of them wanted to play with was the older brother, and he was the guy who was the least. But right away I found out he was the guy who actually was writing songs and was um, 
a bit more um, progressed than everybody else. And so I was sort of, you know, fascinated by him and became friends with him and talked the other guys into letting him back in the band because <laughs> he had the talent. <laughs> he was a guy with the yeah. talent. He was a guy writing songs. and um, <clears throat> So just by chance, we met a guy who happened to move to our small town uh, who was sort of a um, underground rock um, artist from the Northwest from the late 70s who had had a friend that went to college there and ended up uh, coming to, to start a recording studio of all things, which again was really you know, out of nowhere. But um, we met him and he was looking for bands to record. And just, we were pretty much the only band in town, so he ended up recording us. And that's how it started. Yeah, so from that you do, you do the usual thing, you get gigs in proper cities, you get a record deal, and, and the, the whole thing sort of, the band was a big cult band, but when that big wave of uh, bands took off in the early 90s, you didn't quite take off, did you? you sort of, it's kind of on the fringes of a scene that you weren't really part of anyway. I mean, was, was it frustrating when you saw a lot of bands that you kind of knew from playing with just go huge, and you just stay maintain this fairly good cult level? Water's quite dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, it wasn't frustrating, it was totally weird. Um, you know, for me, every step of the way, uh, when somebody wanted to, you know, for instance, put out one of our records, I just thought, you know, how bizarre, why would anyone want to do that? <laughs> but it would happen, and um, by the time the major uh, success of you know so many of the bands that we knew really well and who were our friends uh, happened. You know we had been making records um, sort of like on uh, you know probably at the time the sort of hippest indie label SST in the states for quite a while. And in fact, I mean I remember um, you know Kurt Cobain begging me to get SST to put out a record. Um, and Greg Yen, who ran the label, never was smart enough to take it. <laughs> that was unbelievable. But um, what was it like being an SST worker with Greg Yen? He's got quite an interesting reputation. Well, at first it was fantastic because we were just these hillbillies, you know, and I got, I got a call uh, on the phone in the shop where I was working, and this guy said, hey, I'm Greg Ginn, and I was like, Not, you know, get the fuck out of here. I was like, just kidding, and um, it was him. He wanted to put out one of our records. You know, we had been doing what a lot of bands did, making cassette tapes and then go to shows and give them to the bands that we liked, and some our original drummer gave Greg Ginn one of our cassettes, and actually liked it so at the time that happened we were actually uh, really close to signing a, a long-term like, sort of horrible contract with a um, with another label that was made like a major label contract but with like you know half the money of the worst indie contract so <laughs> not something that you know we wanted to do but <laughs> keep making records. It was it was an option, and um, so when this thing with Greg Ginn happened, it was a uh, godsend. I mean, we idolized Black Flag. Half of our set when we started was Black Flag songs. So, um, you know, it was. It, we were also the first band from Washington State to ever you know make a record for SST. So it was, you know, it was quite. Um, you know, we were. Pretty, pretty full of ourselves for a while. They, they had just the greatest roster at the time, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, the best, it was the best independent label in America at that point, wasn't it? But it seemed run in a very ad hoc kind of way. Like a lot of independent labels run by musicians, it's it's difficult when it takes, it's actually harder when it takes off, isn't it? <laughs> when the bands get big, people just don't quite know what they're doing, do they? Yeah. 
So did you see Black Flag? Were you at that famous Black Flag show in Seattle? The one that they always say the whole that settled scene kind of started from. Was it 84, 85, something like that? Yeah, it was at the boxing club. And that's actually where we gave Greg Gen our tape. Wow, that gig has, every time you speak to anybody, it's about it, they say, that was the moment for me, and that was the moment that happened for you as well. And that was, they, say, they say that was one of the first times that Kurt Cobain had ever been up to Seattle as well, and he was like really young at the time when he got to that show, and Bruce Pavitt was there, one of the Sub Pop people were there, and it's, they say there wasn't even that many people at the show, but everyone went to that show seemed to have done something interesting. Yeah, I guess it was a uh, seminal uh, moment in Seattle. It also, <coughs> There was a couple of um, big black shows that were have sort of a similar um, you know, uh, mystery to them. Mm. Well, that's an incredible group as well, wasn't it? Big Black. Yeah, absolutely. Was it, you were saying before that it was, it was Bruce from Sub Pop. He turned you on to Big Black, didn't he? Yeah, yeah that was that was my um, my gateway to to Big Black and Sonic Youth because. Um, <laughs> Sonic Youth, before I was on SST with Sonic Youth, um, they were making records for, I want to say Homestead or <laughs> Ecstatic Peace, I think. Which they were on Homestead, Homestead. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, Bruce, first time I heard him was him playing. So when did you first meet Bruce? I guess he's quite important in the story, isn't he? Was it, was, did you meet him when he had the uh, local shop? I did, yeah. And, but before I met Bruce, I met John his partner, the guy still runs Sub Pop. <coughs> he was a local uh, college radio DJ and had had our band on his show, and had actually played our first record in its entirety. God, that's embarrassing to think of. <laughs> wow, you <laughs> listened to that show. <laughs> um, yeah, so I met those guys all around at the same time. They were trying to start the label and right about the time when I met them was when our band became affiliated with SST so suddenly we were like uh, well let's just put it this way we became really popular with guys like Bruce and John because you know um, we couldn't have uh, suddenly been hipper yeah. and they were wanting to start their own label so they were always you know, sort of asking us our opinion on stuff and did we want to make records for them mm -hmm. and we didn't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. later of course we did and um, that turned out okay as well but you know it was uh, it, it all sort of a lot of stuff happened in a short period of time mm -hmm. and met a lot of different people and a lot of different stuff happened because of it so is this about the time you met Jeffrey Lee Pierce didn't meet Jeffrey Lee Pierce until, I want to say, 1991, maybe. I was a you know, big, big gun club fan. When I heard the first gun club record, that was a record that made me say, um, that made me think, wow, I can make music myself. And it wasn't, I don't even know why that was, but it was, um, that was a record that made me think, I would like to do this too. And um, later had a friend in common that worked for our band and then worked for him. And I happened to be at a show that he was going to be at as well and was introduced and, and became friends uh, in that way. So, you know, I guess probably for the last, well, maybe it was more like 89, 90, I think, because Jeffrey died, I think, in, I want to say 96. <laughs> So for the last <coughs> seven years or so, we were, we were good friends. So what was it about the gun club? I mean, uh, <clears throat> for me, there's always, when I first heard them, there was something, the way the marriage, what was kind of sort of post-punk or whatever, with deeply traditional American music, and they married it absolutely perfectly. That's what struck me about them. You know, it's the whole new way of making old music. What, what was it that struck you about them? And, and his voice as well, he's a fantastic singer. Yeah, I mean, well, that was the thing that grabbed me first. I had never had any, heard anybody that sang like that. Um, and, you know, it was sort of like, like you said, you know, it was a, I had these blues records that I was into, and then I had these, like, punk rock records. 
and then suddenly here was this thing that you know was both those things, but something else completely different, and something so weirdly personal that I didn't know you know what it was. It made me uncomfortable. Uh, a lot of the lyrics, um, you know, the sort of um, uh, racial uh, quality to some of the the lyrics made me uncomfortable, but yet I, I was like, completely, uh, you know, drawn in and, and couldn't stop listening to it. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those things. And, and I did not meet not one person for, well, of course, I was living in Ellensburg, but <laughs> I did not meet not one person for like 10 years that ever listened to that music and, and didn't say, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, turned away with disgust and <laughs> repugnance. But to me, you know, well, time has, has uh, you know, borne it out. He was one of the all-time greats and just an amazing songwriter, too. That was uh, part of, you know, what was so compelling for me is just that the songs were so just, you know, well, I call it serial killer music. Yeah. <laughs> was he quite dark? <laughs> quite <laughs> terrible, was he? Well, when I first met him, I met him at, at the Whiskey in Los Angeles, and he said, uh, hey man, uh, if you're ever in London, you know, give me a call. I said, well, I'm gonna be there next week. <laughs> well, give me a call. And so, I, it turns out I was staying like in his neighborhood. I called him up. And, he said, oh, hey, yeah, man, well, I'm just going out for a jog. I'll, I'll be by when I'm done running. You know, and you think of him as this That's guy. not why I'm you. No. Yeah. yeah, not many people do if they've you know, heard anything about him. Uh, you know, he went out for his jog, came by in his sweatpants, took me over to his house, made me Mexican food, um, listened to music, and was a complete uh, sweetheart. And, and gentlemen for the entire time that I knew him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, towards the end, he had some health problems, and um, at the very end, um, had uh, his liver, whatever, when the poison goes into your body and gives you delirium, is that what it is? Whatever, you know, went a little bit crazy like that, but it wasn't like he was uh, crazy, crazy. It was just like a weird twist. Yeah. But he was never violent or anything. He did, like, you know, sheepishly show me on VHS tape a couple of, you know, shows, like from the really early 80s when he was, you know, throwing bottles at the audience's head and stuff like that. So. But that's what all gigs are like then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so at that point, you spend a lot of time in Seattle as well. And you, you, you kind of get to know a lot of people in that scene, in the Seattle scene. And you, you've only got friends, people like Kirk Cobain as well, aren't there? So you, um, you did that, you actually did a musical project with Kirk, didn't you? The... Yeah, well, we were sitting around, uh, I guess I could say we were smoking weed. <laughs> We're in Hampton Bridge, though. I can't think of <laughs> Do people smoke weed here? <laughs> it's that kind of town. Yeah. We used to, too. Um, and we were listening to Lead Belly, and, and we just thought, wow, man, we, we should make a whole record of, you know, Lead Belly songs. <laughs> and um, then one of us foolishly said something to John Poneman who ran Sub Pop Records by then and he just you know took off with that idea and ran and booked time in the studio and sort of we were in there before we even really thought about it and kind of um, you know well what songs are we going to do and you know ended up doing three or four songs and sort of losing interest in it pretty quickly <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. I, I kind of though, but then the acoustic Nirvana record in the Pines, and for me it's probably the best thing he ever did. It's such a fantastic version. And is that germinated out of the session you did, the idea of that? Yeah, you know, and if I had been smart, like 
a lot of people, and of course I was never smart, <laughs> but um, you know when when you when you do a new arrangement of a of a, a public domain song, it's suddenly yours and you get <laughs> you get the money from it. I never did that with my arrangement of that song. But oh, it was actually your arrangement. Yeah, the, the yeah. One, the one that we used on my solo record was mm -hmm. the pre was the uh, first one, mm -hmm. and then um, Kurtz was the second one, but his was the definitive version. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the best. Mm -hmm. uh, they both work in different ways, don't they? <laughs> and Lead Bellies was okay. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, a lot of the friendship you had with Kurt, was it because you were both in bands and at the point in time, I guess he was trapped, not by his band, but by the spectacle of his band. And at the same time, you're in a band where, where people just didn't get on with each other. And both being singers, did you find something in common there? Well, I'll tell you what, all of my best friends were singers in bands and all of them didn't get along with their bands. So <laughs> I don't it's just like a weird singer's club. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you know, we would spend a lot of time talking about how um, the guys in our bands were so much like each other. And um, now that I think about it, maybe it was us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the bands are saying. That's what she <laughs> <laughs> So, so you got this friendship with him and other people in, in the town as well. You're, you're friends with uh, Dylan from Earth as well, and he's quite an important figure in this whole kind of these sort of almost the untold stories of South Pole away. You know? I think he's quite a key figure, isn't he? Well, Dylan was the Kurt's best friend mm -hmm. and uh, the best man at his wedding, and, and Kurt or Dylan was also the guy who introduced me to Kurt. And um, Dylan, I've known since I want to say 1984. And, uh, we were really <coughs> in the uh, in the 80s. We lived in a house together when he started his band Earth. It was him and two other guys who lived in the house, played bass. So it was Dylan on guitar and two bass players in the basement. Shaking my bed on the third floor. <laughs> just doing hours of one of those drones. That was it. Yeah. You know, and you knew it would spawn an entire genre. Yeah, <laughs> an entire genre of music. Yeah. He just did a he just did a remix for me, and uh, he said, "Now we've just we've just um, invented uh, the dub drone." Genre. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, you know, he's um, was was a key um, figure just in our circle of friends, you know, and obviously, a, um, you know, an unsung hero, uh, genius musically, and um, really uh, one of the nicest guys ever, uh, one of the sweetest guys you'd ever want to meet. We talked about it before, what's interesting about what he's doing now, that the more conventional it gets, the kind of darker and stranger it is at the same time, isn't it? It still maintains the atmosphere, but it sounds more, more like normal music. Exactly. It's, I mean, I, I appreciated those early records. Mm -hmm. I love those early records. <laughs> but I guess maybe in 2006 or something, when he first sort of went kind of... Um, with the, like a, a little bit of a, 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 how do you put it, country edge mm -hmm. to it, it suddenly became like a whole different thing and just really mind blowing. Um, and I was uh, finally after 30 years, 35 years of knowing him, he asked me to be on a record, which was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they didn't have many vocals before though, did they? No, they didn't. They couldn't ask you to play drums, could they? You know? <laughs> Bring you half a drum kit. And yeah. <laughs> a bag of weed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your career is quite interesting, right? Because there's a, a lot of collaboration. I mean, most people, you know, with singers, they have, like, they have a band and a tour, and they have another band and tour, but you've done I mean, so many different projects. 
I mean, why, why, is there a reason for that at all? Is that something you deliberately try to do to work with different people in an artistic way? I don't know. And my ex-wife called me the Michael Caine of Barack. <laughs> <laughs> You just say yes to everything. Yeah. Yeah. It was while we were watching Jaws 4. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you know, I'm a fan of music and I've been blessed with um, a lot of opportunity. A lot of the stuff I do is with people who I already know and I'm friends with. And, you know, those are the same people that I get to play on my records because they're not going to say no. And they're. <laughs> not going to ask me for money because then I, you know, then they'd have to pay me back the money that they owe me. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, Queens of Stone Age is the probably most famous example. And that, that started because you gave him the break in the first place. Well, I don't know if I'd call it giving him a break after he had his band Caius, mm. you know. Um, he came, to play, came to play with you, didn't he? Yeah. Caius to Screaming Trees, I don't know if that was giving him much of a break, but yeah, I guess, I guess <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah we, we knew each other for a long time and started playing together uh, when he was pretty young, I think, maybe still in his teens, 19. Um, so, uh, you know, I think um, our musical relationship is really sort of secondary to our friendship. Um, it's, uh, we, we go out to the movies and go out to eat and, and occasionally record a song. Yeah. <laughs> well, you end up doing like world tour. Is it, is it, is it sort of stuff never planned? It's just like, you know, do you want to do a song? Do you want to do two songs? Do you want to come on tour? That's exactly how it happened. Um, when he asked me to play on the first Queen's record, I was in the midst of trying to plan what ended up being the not last Screaming Trees record. It never happened. And um, he had booked a really short period of time to, to do the record in. And I was in the midst of doing something else and I didn't end up showing up for it. And um, by the time we made the second one, I was in the same city and I came and did you know a number of things on that. And then at the end of that touring cycle, he was doing one last tour of the UK where Rated R had been you know, pretty successful and um, wanted me to come be the guest singer. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then, you know, well, I'm going to make another record. And my plan now is to have three singers, and I was like, oh man, what? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I kind of fell into it. It, uh, at first it seemed like I was sort of, um, uh, let's put it this way, I, I got used to only singing a little bit, and um, got used to it uh, probably a lot easier than I should have. Mm. In other words, you know, when you're really a singer in a band, you're out, you know, singing for an hour and a half a night. And I got, I got to where I was like, God, I have three songs? Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> and all the way around the world on three songs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't it just be two? <laughs> <laughs> so, did the, did you prefer, did you prefer the collaboration after being in a band where there was tension in it? Was it? Just an easy way to create music, just less pressure. Well, it's a lot easier to collaborate with people that you're not fighting with. You know what I mean? Um, I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I personally don't don't really ever work with people that I don't get along with anymore. That was sort of just out of necessity. Sorry about that. Maybe got a singing job. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's my wife calling to harass me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's no reason to, to do things that are um, that uncomfortable or, or um, don't make you feel good. I think when it comes to music, uh, my, the way I started out in music was just sort of 
you know, it was out of necessity. These were the guys I played with. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, I still, you know, I'm in contact with those guys and I'm still friends with them mm -hmm. and, and all that. They're like family, but you don't, uh, you know, there's a lot of family that you don't hang out with too often either. Mm -hmm. and, you know. It's kind of weird that people think people are bound to hang out. I mean, after you be on, done a world tour, you don't say, what you do next Tuesday? It's <laughs> nothing left to talk about, is it? <laughs> so, um, so in a sense, Screaming Trees is almost like a collaboration then, because they were writing the songs and you were singing them, weren't you? Yeah, for the for the records we did in the eighties, that was the case. I started um, <clears throat> at some point, like changing lyrics to try and you know make them have some sort of meaning to me because the songs that the guitar player in Screaming Trees was writing when we started were the thing he was into was sort of a um, I guess like a Nuggets era psychedelia, mm -hmm. which you know has its merits and everything, but you know I was into Joy Division, and you can't be further apart <laughs> uh, in, in the approach of those two things. You know, it's just so I always felt I, I never enjoyed singing the words that were you know uh, about. Rainbow, yellow colored skies, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So to try and to try and make it so I could survive in it, and, and they wanted me to stay, I started by trying to change the words, and that was not any fun. Um, and then eventually we signed with a major label, and our first record we did the same way we had done all our indie records, and. Then I quit, and they wanted to make another record with the major, and um, by that time I had made my first solo record, and sort of learned that, you know, I could be creative. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I've made seven records of this stuff that I'm, I'm not happy with, I don't enjoy it. Uh, if I'm gonna make another one, then I'm gonna be part of the creative process in a more serious way. And um, so the last two records we did, I, I wrote the, you know, the words and the singing parts. And, and um, those, not to toot my own horn, but those were our only two successful records. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's lots of people that say, God, you know, those records that trees made in the 90s suck. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first solo record, you you saying that you just made the songs up, but the, uh, the melodies and the lyrics, but you couldn't actually play any instruments. Mm -hmm. So you had to go and learn to play guitar to put the chords in behind the, the words and the melodies, which is interesting. It's like a back-to-front way of writing, isn't it? It's completely backwards, yeah. Which, of course, I, I was working in a warehouse, and towards the end of the day, I would come up with a vocal melody in my head, and I would try and remember it on the bus all the way home, and then I would get out the guitar chord book that I had, and, and then like, I'd find the chords that went underneath the melody, and wrote uh, you know, a record's worth of songs, but then had my friend who could actually play guitar come in and put the intros and the middle sections and all the other, you know? The music, yeah. The music. <laughs> all the music did something. <laughs> but later, I, uh, you know, slowly learned how to actually write a song. Mm -hmm. So that now when you write a song, would you start on an instrument or do you still make the melodies up in your head? No, I, I never. Uh, start with the melody in my head. Oftentimes I'm doing it at the same time as I'm, you know, mm -hmm. playing a chord, uh, making sound with my voice while I'm making sound with an instrument, or I will build something, um, you know, start with a drum machine beat and a synthesizer or a Casio keyboard, and build the music, and then come up with the singing part over the top of it. Mm -hmm. um, or if somebody else is writing the music, obviously I'm just, you know, making up the singing part and writing the words. There's a lot of different ways of doing it, but 
the one way I never do it anymore is the way I first did it because it's the hardest. Which was, <laughs> oh, you mean when you work in the factory? Yeah. yeah. Starting with a vocal melody. Do you find it's changed the way you write songs? That, you know, you've learned to play more instruments and you're working in that kind of way or working off drum loops or whatever. That's, does that change the way you create the melodies and the, the songs themselves? You know, it, it has made it so I can actually make the kind of records that I personally enjoy listening to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the first records I made, I mean, granted, I was actually, you know, listening to Leonard Cohen and Tim Buckley and Nick Drake for the first time when I was making my first solo records, and they were like, heavily influenced by that. Um, you know, sort of really stripped down, folky, acoustic, dark, depressing <laughs> music. Um, but really, that was the only kind of music I knew how I could make at that time. Um, now I can uh, I have a couple of different tricks up my sleeve and I just um, make the kind of music that I would actually enjoy going out and playing live. I mean, speaking of collaborations again, you've, some people you've worked with are pretty amazing. We talked before about you know, actually worked with Johnny Cash and done gigs with him, been in the studio with him. That must have been a hell of an experience. Well, yeah, I mean. Um, when they uh, when they made the first Johnny Cash American record, they asked a lot of different guys to um, you know uh, do you have songs to submit for Johnny to do like a new song, and I had just seen this TV special on um, the Reverend Billy Graham, and Johnny Cash figured heavily in it. It was his relationship with Billy Graham, and and I thought. Oh, Johnny Cash is not going to sing my dark music, you know, <laughs> what the hell. And of course, um, you know, when the record came out, it was Glenn Danzig songs. And <laughs> <laughs> I totally like gave him, you know, the pretty much the softest thing that I had. And yeah. um, out thought myself, but didn't make it on the record. By the time he made his second record, I had um, played some shows with him. And, uh, I had a friend who uh, was an engineer working on the second American record, and I got to spend some time in the studio there. And it was, um, you know, here's a guy who's just done every possible thing, you know, from A to Z, and from the floor to the top, and was so humble and so nice, and uh, just you know, gave everyone a hug and came through the door. Offered you a biscuit. <laughs> it was it was pretty intense, and he was um, made quite a quite a uh, impact on me. More way to what you learn from him what, as, a, as a person or, or creatively. As a you know creatively, I mean, I've been you know learning from him ever since I first heard Johnny Cash. Because your father was a big fan, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure that um, every song I've probably ever written, there's like a little piece of Johnny Cash that I've managed to steal and put back out. Um, but just as a person, you know what I mean? Uh, just thinking, here's this man, you know, um, just uh, could not be nicer. And maybe I could be a little nice. Well, it's about it's more than three decades of rock and roll now. It sounds crazy. I mean, what, what have you learned on the way? Good. <laughs> I, I, I haven't learned anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> and not even, you know, how to get out of the street in time. <laughs> I, I've just learned that... Um, you know, I have no idea why, why some guys, like, why are we still talking about music, you and I? I mean, do you ever think about that? It's so, the most magical thing in the world. Yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, just the incredible luck that we have to be two guys sitting here talking about music mm -hmm. after all these years.
and somebody actually gives a damn. I don't know, were you people paid to be here? <laughs> <laughs> Just getting the money back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you started, you must be very naive, you know, like small town bands. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, the naivety. It's, it's something, it's always sad when people lose it. But it's different from big city bands, because there's nobody to ask. I mean, do you still retain any of that naivety? I do, but you know, it's it's more in like common sense stuff. Um, I have to be shown where the outhouse is. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> People were smiling. They just weren't making a noise. <laughs> Damn. Because when you the band when you do school trees, you must be learning on the hoof in a way. And when you the first time you went to Seattle and met some of the city bands, they, they probably knew what to do before they had the band in a way, because they were in a place where you could go and hang out with the cool record shop and hear the cool records and talk about meet other bands for a start doing the same thing, whereas you were so isolated on your own. I mean that must have had an effect on you. Absolutely. You know, I mean it's uh I still have always like sort of gone out of my way to not pay attention to what's happening um, as far as the business of music and uh, also what's um, you know uh, the, the popular thing. I've always just tried to focus on the uh, the same things that I focused on when I started, which was um, you know finding stuff that I really loved and uh, got excited about and then found the thing that that led me to and, and that's really I think why I still make music is because I have tried to keep that uh, that sort of uh, attitude. Now, uh, this probably make you feel embarrassed but you do have like a really amazing singing voice, this really beautiful voice. I mean what, what was, it, was it people influenced you into that style of singing? It's very distinctive. Would you say like, you know, because you've got a love joy division, we say in Kurt's sort of influence, you know, like kind of very dark, kind of crooning kind of style? Or is that just, is that just coincidence? Am I just shooting in the dark here? Well, no, man. I mean, you know, there's so many singers that, uh, I mean, I've, I've stolen as much from John Cale as I have from Paul Rogers, as from Rocky Erickson, mm -hmm. Sun House, you know, Jeffrey Lee Pierce was really... You know, I was the first ten records I made. I was trying to sound like Jeffrey Lee Pierce mm -hmm. and um, Falling James from the Leaving Trains. You know, guys like that. Those were the guys that I, I wanted to sound like. And um, eventually, I just uh, I guess ended up sounding like me. Mm -hmm. Probably when I stopped thinking about sounding like other people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it just want to chat before to talk about you know people's voices and how people's voices just get really shot when they get older? But you were saying, and we both agree this is a good thing, you know, like the last Bob Dylan album where he's barely got any voice left, but it sounds great. And and you say this is not something you're worried about, you know, losing the voice. It's actually it's a good thing in a way. Well, I mean, I, I distinctly remember in the early '90s being really sick and just, you know, being aware of how much better my voice sounded when it was, you know, completely destroyed. <laughs> so I never learned how to, uh, you know, do any warm-up exercises or any of that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I just figure uh, I'll probably be okay as long as it's, you know, as long as they don't remove the voice box. <laughs> yeah, combine. <laughs> but, yeah, because you, at some point in your life, you, you pushed it a bit, haven't you, on the end, um, the, the kind of rock and roll lifestyle, etc. But you don't anymore. Do you find that makes a difference to you creatively and, and to your life itself, really? Well, sure. I mean, you know, life itself is... Uh, <laughs> much, much better now. Mm -hmm. 
um, than it was in my days of excess. But um, the uh, the creative thing, same with that, you know. Um, I don't know about other people, but for me, it's tough to create when I'm unhappy. Uh, it might sound like I'm unhappy when you know you hear the song, <laughs> but to be able to make it, I have to sort of be in a you know in a pretty even keel place. And again, in those times of excess, I was not in any sort of shape to you know, <coughs> be creative. So. Um, you know, in, in those ways, sure, it's uh, it's like night and day, really. But the best thing that I had done, uh, above and beyond everything else, was quitting smoking, which I never thought I would do. Um, I thought, you know, I mean, that was my identity, the guy who smokes, mm -hmm. and that would be it for the rest of my life. And by chance, I just ended up... Um, friend of mine I was playing music with had a health problem and couldn't smoke and everybody we were getting ready to go on tour and everybody in the band stopped smoking like a month before we were going on tour and I found out about it like a week before and I thought thanks you know I'm the dickhead who didn't quit smoking <laughs> and now that I have uh, I, I've noticed a you know, I, I don't know if my range is any better or any of that, but I definitely have a, uh, uh, a lot more staying power, you know, mm -hmm. a lot more energy. Um, it's, it's really, um, so glad I lived long enough to quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the right all the time. <laughs> and I, I love the way you perform the songs. You you just all, it looks like you're inhabiting the song and your own world, your eyes are shut, you're holding the mic. I can't really hold this mic because it's... <laughs> but you actually do that on stage, don't you? It's completely locked in. And is, is that something you've actually even noticed that you do? I mean, or you just, that's how you've, it's just kind of morphed into that. Well, at first when I couldn't sing at all, you know, in the early Screaming Trees, I jumped around like a dickhead. <laughs> Felt like a dickhead. <laughs> and was a dickhead. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I started to like learn how to sing and, and come, you know, actually feeling like I want to get better at this and, and do it to my satisfaction, I had to start paying attention to it. And if I paid attention to what was going on everywhere else, I did it. You know, didn't work, you know, I, I was not on it, and uh, eventually, yeah, I just came to a place where really I just wanted to inhabit the song, and to do that I had to be in the moment, and for me to be in the moment, I can't be in your moment, or the moment of, you know, the guy on the side of the stage <laughs> waving at me, or whatever, so I just uh, try and pay attention to exactly what I'm doing. And it doesn't look like it's very hard, but I'm actually, uh, uh, my uh, laundress would, would tell you how sweaty my clothes are <laughs> <laughs> if I had <laughs> so, so with the eyes shut and everything, you are totally, you're in that space and that's it. You're just totally lost in the song and the sound. Is it, is it the lyrics or the actual sound and the atmosphere that you get lost in when you're performing? It's the whole thing. Um, sometimes, on a weird occasion, uh, I'll suddenly uh, realize what it is I'm singing about, or for the first time, a lyric might, you know, um, be telling me what it what it is, and uh, that's not something that happens a lot. But when it does, that's weird. Oh, so you actually go, oh, that's what I meant. Exactly. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And it can throw me off my game. So when you create music, you create, it's, 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 the words aren't really sort of, oh, that's what it is. It's, you know, some people say, these are the words, this is what I'm explaining. But the words are just part of the whole thing. You, just, you are creating an atmosphere with the music. Yeah, I mean, there's always a, a, some bit of um, 
reality uh, something that you know might have actually happened to me or somebody I know or something I heard about or something I thought about I mean you know th there's a there's a piece of reality in it but a song is to me um, I just describe them as like uh, sort of pieces of dreams you know for lack of a better um, description and um, like I said at those times when I suddenly realized what it is that it means it's um, it's pretty cool mm. okay, but I guess it could change all the time anyway they'll call play songs yeah context interpretation very true it's great though the person singing it's changing for them as well though yeah. it keep, keeps me interested in it mm. okay well thanks Mark I think that's the time yeah, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.